I'm the CEO and Senior Art Advisor at Tang Art Advisory. So Tang Art Advisory is an art advisory firm that assists private clients with buying, selling and managing their art. Since we operate in the US, we operate in Europe and in Asia, uh, we feel that um, you know, we really are the advocates for the clients. So whatever art requirements they have, we want to be able to help them out with it. I think technology is going to be a huge driver in the art world and it's really going to help to uh, you know, distinguish the companies that are going to be able to make it and the companies who are going to find it more difficult. I'm proud to Sony Yami and I'm the Director of Partnerships and Communications at Art Place America. And we're a collaboration among a number of foundations, federal agencies and financial institutions that are focused on arts and culture as a problem-solving tool within communities. Well, part of what's so exciting, for us at least, is that we're seeing that so many artists are investigating the ways that tech can influence their practices, and just generally when it comes to any kind of problem-solving, more people who are working in tech are quite creative-minded, and the creative problem-solving that it takes to innovate in a space that moves as quickly as tech is quite in line with what it takes to be a successful artist. In many cases, I think that it's pretty much the same population of folks who are doing the work. Whether your medium is ones and zeros, or your medium is paint. It's not just about art as something that's great to have around, but it's really investigating the unique value that it can bring to problem solving across any sector, regardless of where you come from. My name is Zee Chun, and I'm the founder of Uprise Art. We're an online gallery. We represent emerging artists and connect them with collectors from all over the world. The art world is traditionally about kind of making deals behind closed doors and um, needing to know someone who knows someone. And the way we incorporate tech is through content. We introduce collectors who are maybe new collectors, have never purchased original work, or um, are seasoned art collectors who are looking for emerging artists they've never heard of, we connect them with our artists through social media, through stories about these artists on our blog. Beyond um, representing artists and introducing them to collectors, we also have an invest over time model, which means that if you love a piece of art, you can take it home and purchase it through monthly installments. So you take home a painting and pay $50 a month until you own it. And that's something that has made art more accessible. We have a really good presentation for you guys this evening on art, technology, and entrepreneurism. And our goal when we talked about having this event was to bring together um, some professionals from the industry to come and talk about how uh, you know the future of art um, is going to align with business opportunities, different entrepreneurial aspects, and really where it's heading and how it's going to change how we um, present art, how we understand it, how we learn about it, and. Um, even from a business perspective, how we market it. Uh, so, I am going to let our uh, moderator, Brendan Burns, um, he's a professor at Eugene Land Entrepreneurship Center at Columbia's Graduate Business School, and he spent 20 years um, leading technology, graphic arts, and financial firms, and he's our moderator today, so I'm gonna hand it over to him to uh, introduce our panel. Thanks, Nikki. Um, before we get started, I wanna ask people a question. Title of this uh, our talk tonight. We'll see where it goes. But the title of the talk is "Art, Tech, and Entrepreneurism." Um, how many people heard the phrase "Art, Tech" used together a, within a year ago? Nobody. You guys have, right? How about three? How about three, how about three? How about three years ago? Not so much. Not so much, though, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Art tech is a really interesting idea to me, and, and I want to share just a little bit about my perspective, which is when I was graduating from the business school at Columbia in 1995, I thought I wanted to be in, you know, a diluted moment, an investment <coughs> banker. And um, I, I was saved from that. Um, my wife isn't always so sure, but I was saved from that by the internet. And so I started a, um, 
uh, an internet company in New York with a few other people. And um, our approach was a little bit unique uh, in that at the time what we were doing was very unique. Sounds pretty old school today, but we, we were one of the first companies to uh, take classified ads and put them online. There's a lot more to the story than that, but we were one of the first companies to do that. And what was unique in the context of other companies we were around is that um, we actually made money using the internet as a distribution channel, which very few companies did in 1995, much less even five years later. So, um, the reason why that's relevant to me today is I saw a lot of things happen over the ensuing, you know, couple years after we started that company and then the 20 years I've been involved in this space. And so for, in preparation for tonight, I started thinking a little bit about, you know, where are we in art tech? Like nobody was using the term, like outside of really people who, who were engaged in art. Um, where you was using the term art tech, investors weren't, okay? You know, much less lay people, or even people reading, you know, media and other people were popularizing it. Even people who were print, or I'm sorry, who were art world journalists weren't using that term. There were very few art oriented or art tech startups. So I went to uh, Angel List today. There are over 800 art startups on Angel List today. And, uh, I, and then I also, I went to um, uh, kind of just doing a couple, just a little bit of simple research and I found a list of like the best art startups uh, in 2013. So, you know, probably a year and a half ago this was published. And I'll just read a couple of them. Get Up Art, Artsicle, Rise Art, um, First Divs, which isn't really an art company per se. Um, VIP Art, Art Space, 20 by 200. Artsy, several others. Every single one of these companies is doing almost exactly the same thing for me, which is they're selling art online. And the reason why, there's nothing wrong with that, but, but the reason why I bring it up is that I think we're so early in the evolution of art tech and how it's changing the way we engage and think about art um, in our lives, and that the, the 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 real goal for I mean for for me, but but you know particularly you know for Prentice Z and Annalyn is really about figuring out how you take your company, you differentiate it in a way that really resonates with people and create something that absolutely changes the way we do things. Not by our better alone. To me, that's the that's the challenge. Because the first order problem and what everybody is thinking about, and I just cited the facts, right? Is, oh, let's sell art online, you know? And I, I don't mean to sound condescending about it, but it's a simple problem. What's really interesting, and where true economic value and impact on people's lives is gonna be, is gonna come from, is how you actually really change things. So, um, these guys are here to tell you about how they're going to change things. Um, <laughs> and, um, so, practice only on Ona Yemi. Welcome. Serves as the Director of Partnerships and Communications at Art Place America. Recently graduated from Columbia's MBA program. How come I never saw you? Um, Oh, geez. Along, well, you've been saved as well, I guess. <laughs> Along with being a trained and accomplished actor, a member of the Actors Equity Association and the Screen Actors Guild of BFA and Drama, and the co-founder of Jack, a performing arts council in the Clinton Hill neighborhood of Brooklyn, Prentice is a formidable, is a formidable entrepreneurial mind. Did you write that? No. <laughs> Prentice co-authored two case studies on artists as social entrepreneurs that was published this past April in this past April's Harvard Business Review. Z Chun graduated from Columbia College and worked in the performing and visual arts for several years before starting Uprise Art, an online gallery for the next generation of art collectors that features a highly curated roster of contemporary artists. 
and makes collecting original art easier and more affordable. She has delivered talks on art and entrepreneurship at Harvard Business School, Columbia Business School, the Affordable Art Fair, excuse me, the Apple Store, and other institutions, and was recently featured in Forbes.com, Alley Wire, Under 30 CEO, and Martha Stewart. Annalyn Bruns has operated in the international art world for 15 years, she has managed privately owned collections of art, antiques, and collectibles, has set up collections consultancy, through which she advised private and corporate clients in Europe, the US, and Asia on art transactions and art portfolio management, and now works at Tang Art Advisory. Annalyn was named Best Art Advisor by Spears Wealth Management in 2014. Is a sought after writer and guest speaker, having been invited to lecture at Christie's Education and Sotheby's Institute. Art, on the topics of art management, the art market, and setting up an art business. Annalyn has been interviewed by CNBC, Thomson Reuters, Barron's Asia, and many other prestigious journals. Thank you. Of course. So um, I want to start, let's start at, at uh, Annalyn's end and ask, um, what was the inspiration for, you didn't start um, Hank. Uh, I did with my CEO. You did, okay. Yeah. What was the inspiration for the company? And can you give us like, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds on what you guys do? Um, I started um, working in the art world 50, about 50 years ago in London. Um, I managed two very large private collections of art and antiques um, and collectibles. And it, I'd done it for, for a number of years and I realized that it would be very difficult for me to go find another job because I was so specialized in what I did. Set up a company in the UK, um, did it for a number of years, and um, the reason for um, Tang is that um, we started getting clients here, uh, so we felt that we wanted to be able to service Tang as Tang's <coughs> clients uh, here from the US rather than, rather than from Europe, so that's why Tang was set up. So what we do is we help private clients buy, sell, and manage their, you know, collections of art or uh, buy and sell artworks. Right. Susan. Um, I lost my voice, just to let you know, so if you can't hear me in the back, there's nothing I can do about it. Just talk later. <laughs> Find me after. Um, I started Uprise Art three years ago, and at the time, there weren't that many art startups. Um, and I launched this idea of making art collecting easier. So at the time, I had graduated from undergrad 2006 at Columbia. It was um, an art history major through the American Science Department. So I had lots of artist friends, people who were involved um, in the art world in some way, shape, or form. And I also went through an entrepreneurship track, which similarly, back in 06, was not uh, as hot of a word. And um, also it was 06, so there was a lot of young people who were going straight from my class right into finance or going to law school or becoming consultants. And they would always complain about how you know, their lives were so boring and oh, you must have so much, so many fun art parties and oh, I, my gorgeous apartment is so boring and cookie cutter. And I realized that there was just these two groups of people who um, were not interacting. There was these talented young artists who are trying to get their art out there and they're all looking up to um, establish art collectors and trying to get their attention. At the same time, there are all these young people who are interested in art. You know, they had their free Columbia Pass go to the moment they met and they never used it and similarly now working at investment banks and you can get into any, you know, any place they want to um, that they sponsor and similarly not going. So, um, long story short, that's why I launched Uprise Art, was to make art collecting more accessible um, and introduce these two groups of people at an earlier point in both their careers. So originally launched with this idea of invest over time. You know, you can, um, you can have someone fall in love with a piece of art and they may tell you, I'll, but I can't write a check for $1,000 or like, you know, but I don't know anything about art, so it's hard for me to write a check for $500. So this idea of take it home, pay $50 a month, and then you'll eventually own it, was what we launched on. And the company has very much grown and changed, so um, we still have that model, about a third of our clients use it. 
and now we've grown to have about um, more than 80 artists. It's still highly curated, but we are exhibiting at the art fair this weekend. If you'd like to see some of the art in person, let me know. We're at Pulse in Chelsea, and I'll set aside some passes for you. You can see what we do. Um, yeah, in person. So I'll focus on Art Place, which I can take absolutely no credit for founding in any way, shape, or form. But um, Art Place grew out of Rocco Landisman's tenure as chairman of the NEA. So he went down to DC and he said that he wanted to double the NEA's budget. And within a week, realized that wasn't going to happen. So his goal then became to see how he could get the arts on the budgets of other federal agencies. And so he started really focusing on playing that inside game. Then he was questioning, okay, if we want to follow these dollars, what's the outside game that should be played? And who are the tastemakers in terms of how capital flows to the arts outside of the public arena? And he honed in on the fact that it's private philanthropy. And so he got together a bunch of foundation presidents in a room and said, look, I would like for you guys to support this kind of work. And one after another, they made these commitments. And so Art Place was formed, and it's a collaboration among eight foundations, oh, sorry, 14 foundations, eight federal agencies, and six financial institutions that are focused on arts and culture as a community problem solving tool. So we advocate for arts and culture to be at the table for around conversations for community planning and development. And so that each of these sectors is seen as one that merits intentional investment and that can also support the goals of the other sectors. And um, so it's a really exciting space for us. Uh, since 2011, oh, we are a 10-year project, so we're going to sunset. And since 2011, we primarily focused on grant making. We've supported 189 projects, 42 states plus DC, average grant of about 330K. And now we're focusing on a larger grant making project, investing over a larger, a longer period of time and a larger dollar amount, up to $3 million over three years, and in six CDCs, so looking at place-based NGOs, and that's really investigating what it takes to incorporate arts and culture into community planning and development on a local level, and us being very participatory in that role. And then, you know, we're funding all of these projects, but to what end, unless we're learning something, and then are taking that learning and packaging it in a way to empower those people who end up occupying those seats at the table. So we're focusing quite a bit on research and then field building, which is my particular charge, where looking at the people, orgs, networks that are doing the work or should be doing the work and encouraging them to do it, especially long after we sunset in 2020. How, can I, I wanna, uh, that's pretty interesting. How, how do you guys measure success? <laughs> okay, so first and foremost, we measure success by the efficacy of the projects. And in many cases, How it's you, just, but and, and in many cases, that's about just the projects getting done. There are dreamers who are dreaming up incredible things, sure. and the fact that it's happening is a win in and of itself. Like a guy like um, Brian Corrigan out in Denver, who is a software developer, a video game developer, and he wanted to make interactive video games on jumbotrons. <laughs> And he managed to talk to the folks in the local theater district and was able to co-opt their jumbotrons to make interactive video games out on the street and turned the entire street into an arcade. So it's not the type of thing where you can say like, oh, well, it drove, you could say it drove X amount of foot traffic to this area that wouldn't have been there before, that tied to a certain amount of drinks that they got at the bars and the restaurants, you know, we can go that route. But for us, it's like, damn, that's pretty cool. Yeah. But then, well, yes, I'm sure I'll be able to chime in. <laughs> oh, that's, that's interesting. How do you guys measure success? Yeah. So, um, to speak to your earlier point about selling art online, we very much do that. We sell art online. But what we've noticed is that um, buying art is not like any other product. It's, or, I guess, art is not like any other product, and selling art is not like any other industry. So, um, whereas if you were going to say, I. I sell jeans, denim jeans, and um, successes. There's a certain like a sales cycle. People buy jeans every X number of months, and this is the price point of our jeans. With art, um, we have collectors who are engaged to 
come to our exhibitions, who visit us at art fairs, who follow us on Instagram, um, shameless plug, Uprise NYC <laughs> on Instagram, and they're engaged, but they may not buy a piece of art for us from us um, for two years. And then when they do, they may buy five pieces, they may buy one piece. It's a very unpredictable sales cycle, and um, for us, engagement is actually how we measure success over number of pieces sold or dollar revenue. And we think that it's much harder to build a community of people who are um, comfortable engaging with art. And so we think that kind of, you know, we're, we're a startup long term thing about what our value is and what we're creating is we're creating a community of people who are actively engaged with art. You know, when I listen to you, there, there's a, um, something that you make me think of, which I, I think it might be difficult to, to prove, but is a, an absolutely valid way to measure success, if you could, is that my guess is that you're creating art consumers at an earlier stage of their lives than they otherwise would have. And and there's a, there's a theme here that I, I want to point out to people, which is why I wanted to start out with the phrase of art tech, is that th this is a market that's evolving super rapidly that, you know, again, there were a handful of startups three years ago. There are, you know, pro thousands probably today, right? Each one of those companies is doing something a little bit different, and they're each carrying the water to evolve a market. And, and so each and so what's important about that is you're creating a new market in innovation is that you ha you're, you're sort of distributing the effort of innovation and creating um, an audience and that that we have seen that happen over and over again in the evolution of the internet you know over the last um, over the last 20 years I, I did, just as a, a tiny aside you know my first office was two blocks away almost exactly at the same time of year on a similar day to today. It was like the summer of, I'm sorry, the winter of um, 1996. I remember being in like the 18th floor or something at 75 Barrack Street on, on a Wednesday, looking down and the city was shut down and there was somebody cross country skiing down Canal Street. <laughs> and I, I remember it clear as day because the thought in my mind was like, what the fuck are we doing? Is anybody going to use the internet? <laughs> a true story, you know. And and so and we, you're seeing these things happen. So we're at a very nascent stage in a lot of ways, and it, we could have this in a year from now and three years from now. It'd be massively different. I'm sorry, I, I cut no, you off. No, I think that's that's a good point. I mean, similarly, people used to think, you know, who would buy shoes online? And I think the question I used to get a lot more than I do now is. People used to ask, well, do people really buy art without having seen it? And I do get much, much fewer, many fewer questions about buying art sight unseen now than I did three years ago when we launched. Um, it's about expanding the, mar the, the market. It's about finding a demographic of people who wouldn't buy art, wouldn't have otherwise bought art for another you know, 20, 30, 40 years. You go to the art fairs, and there's a lot of people who wait until they're retired and wealthy and have time to go and look at art. And they don't typically at that stage actually support young artists right? mm -hmm. yeah. because they're looking for more validation in their purchase decisions. Yeah. yeah. That's, not, that's not necessarily true in my experience. I think um, a, a lot of people do buy, you know, masterpieces, but they also try to, mo I take that all of my clients have, have some contemporary art. Um, how do you how do you help them find that? Um, we saw. Can I just also answer to your yeah, question yeah, about, sorry. about what it's, you measure, how you measure, measure yeah, success? Sorry. Because I measure it in dollars. So can I pay my staff? You know, do we make money? I really, um, I think for me it's maybe different because we really, as an art advisory firm, it's kind of a me too business. So it's difficult to distinguish yourself, you know, from other art advisory <coughs> firms. I think one of the ways in which we want, which we do distinguish ourselves, is just in our in how we approach, you know, our relationship with our clients, but also how we want to start using technology to be really, you know, ahead of our competitors. And I think, to your earlier points in your introduction, I think the art world is really, um, it, you see such a huge shift from a from from a 
from an industry that that's been quite archaic, really. That has been existing of very small lifestyle businesses um, that are difficult to scale. Um, and you see, you can see it in, in every part of the art world where there's companies trying to figure out how to incorporate technology into you know their, you know what they're doing on a day to day basis. And you see some companies who are very good at it, um, other companies who aren't so good at it. Um, and I think that's really technology is really going to be the deciding factor, you know, over the next ten years in what companies are going to be able to keep up and are going to be, you know, not just showing the art but also. What you said earlier about a distribution model, how efficient are they going to be able to use all those tools that they have available now and adapt to that ever-changing that, you know, that's environment? That's a phenomenal segue. I was going to ask next how you think technology is changing things, and um, in general, and then specific to your own business. And, and I, w I want to say, I was at a uh, this exclusive kind of dinner several weeks ago, and, um, and there was a short panel discussion um, with two art world experts. One was like a very senior guy at Sotheby's, and I forget what the, the other guy did. And the, and the woman who was asking the questions was masterful. But towards the end of the conversation, she said, so how's technology impacting your business and something else? Both of them dodged the question. She came back to it. And it's a very, um, it's a, it, you know, it, I think it's you either embrace it or you're scared by it. And I think you know that kind of determines how how successful you're going to be. If you look at, for example, one of the auction houses, Christie's, they're very <coughs> they're very good at starting to reconfigure their auctions and putting them online. They have a very strong digital strategy there. Um, and I think the other thing is that, but you know, your digital presence is no longer oh it's digital, oh it's online or whatever. Let's not bother too much. It's really a part of your marketing strategy, if not the most important part of your. You know, marketing strategy. So um, I think it's going to be very important. But they still thrive on opacity. Many of these places, right? Yeah, but that's the other. That's a very good point. That, that's changing too, because first of all, you've got all of these online databases that now provide you know price information. That said, they only provide part of the picture. It's not a hundred percent. It will never be a hundred percent clear. But I believe. Um, and this is why we as a firm, we only have one set commission because we want to be completely transparent. It's becoming a much more efficient market because collectors are starting to ask more questions because they have many more tools and many more, much more information available than they had before. So they be, and they're becoming more assertive, which is a really, really good thing. And they're expecting different things from, you know, an art, an art professional. They expect transparency because that's just been, I think, in any, uh, in any industry, really, technology has had the same effect as it has in the art world, is that it makes things more, information more available, and therefore it, it kind of empowers, you know, the, the consumer. So I think you see that in the art world as well. And um, it, it, the, the opacity can't continue forever. And, you, and I can see that on a daily basis, that people are starting to ask questions. There's lawsuits being, you know, being uh, pursued. Over, over things that weren't clear or that weren't explained before. So, yeah, I think that's a very valid point. Mm -hmm. Francis, I feel like tech is grafting creative expression to the unfolding of our lives in a way that is really exciting. In that now the barriers of, to entry of recording a song or mm -hmm. publishing a play or shooting a video of your nephew doing a dance are minimal. They've just disappeared, and it's thanks to tech. And then also that distribution mechanism of giving, of accomplishing Andy Warhol's, Warhol's goal of us all being able to have our moment of fame is, exists thanks to tech. And so it's really, I just get really excited about the fact that tech is making it, it's turning us all into creatives, all into culture. That um, I mean, what we we always think about kind of artists uh, like our jobs is in our gallery and as art dealers is telling a story, and being storytellers, and trying to tell the artist's story as best as we can. I think that with tech, what's amazing is that um, being a gallerist is really about being a content creator, and you have so many more tools. You know, we can 
take anyone in the world inside the um, artist's studio. I was about to say inside the actor's studio, just because. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you can take you can take anyone inside an artist's studio. You can have them um, see a snapshot, like a literal snapshot from someone's life as they're creating a piece of art, and giving them the context around the artwork, what the artist is inspired by, is a much easier story to tell. I think that for us, you know, we don't have a very elaborate algorithm for finding art. We're not actually technically that advanced in what we do as a company, but the tech tools that we use is based on content. It's on creating interesting content that keeps people engaged with um, maybe a specific artist, maybe a specific piece of work, or maybe just art in general. When you say that you're talking about content marketing specifically? Um, not yet, I think it's... Um, social media, content marketing. Um, it's also much easier for us to engage with collectors from all over the world. Um, we're able to share images and that content much easier. They feel, probably this is why it's easier to have people buying art online. They feel like they, um, there isn't, it just closes the gap. There isn't actually that much distance between them and, and the work they're about to acquire. Where, where do you guys, for, for the audience, where do you see um, opportunities, job growth, ways to, uh, to have an impact for creatives at this intersection? You know, maybe that's happening today or that you think will happen. The, the artist is entrepreneur, the, as they themselves being an entrepreneur is going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, very rapidly, marketplaces, like Etsy, the ability for people to sell art even just by having an Instagram account, and that um, you know, this will make her movement and includes artists. I think, yeah, I, I agree, and I think that to both of your earlier points about the barriers being removed, I think there's a whole different level at which you compete now because there are no barriers so anybody can do it and now you've now now you have a different challenge of how are you going to distinguish yourself as an artist or as an entrepreneur it's quite interesting I don't know the answer to that you know I guess we'll see that over the next 10 years what's what's happening there but um, I think in terms of you know the intersection between art and technology I always think that creativity you thinking about the question earlier in preparation for the panel, I thought there always has to be creativity. Whatever your whatever your firm is that you're going to set up, or whatever your business is that you're going to have to set, up, you know, the fact that you're doing it and that you have to be resourceful about how you're going to do it as an artist or as a performing artist or as an entrepreneur, that that requires a lot of creativity. You know, I, I see creativity as a really positive thing and unquestionably in you know achieving your goals. I always I always say you know I mean I teach in the business school. But I would say to students that that, um, that performing arts, and, and often for me, one of the something I love is spoken word, is uh, is one of the most entrepreneurial expressions because it's at its essence you're taking an idea or an emotion, and you're creating, you're packaging something that's infused with what's important to you, and sharing it with people, um, and trying to evoke you know, a response. And creative expression in business is all about, you know, entrepreneurship, or maybe, or maybe the reverse is true. Um, I think that points yeah. out something that's really important, and it's that um, we co-hosted a gathering with the San Francisco Fed, where Gary Haddam, who runs philanthropy and uh, uh, like social investments for Deutsche Bank was there, and he said that culturals, undervalue themselves. They as an they don't understand their own worth. That's a neat point. And and I think that, you know, software developers are getting it because they see, oh supply demand, I can pretty much do it. And but when you look at the tremendous value that the arts can bring outside of simply being an end in and of themselves, but as a means to an end, I think that there is so much growth that's going to happen there. And as the, as more sophisticated financing and traditional markets start to take the risk of figuring out how to manage that kind of risk in investment in the arts, then I think there's going to be quite a bit of growth and, and just wiggle room. 
excited about that. That's that's a fascinating point. Anybody want to respond to that? Um, I kind of had a sort of other thought that kind yeah. of occurred to me when you were talking, which is that you see actually see a lot of consolidation, I think, in the art world. So there, you know, for example, because of the globalization, because of technology, which also which makes my life easier as well in, in sourcing art and so on. Um, you see that a lot of big galleries are starting to, you know, ha have presences in all the, the global centers and I think there's a gap between sort of the, the I don't know how you feel about this but like sort of the super gallery and and it seems like the middle is kind of falling out of it a little bit where you have like the, the startup <coughs> galleries who are really really struggling and then the very highly successful ones that are basically just marketing machines like luxury goods or you know something like that so um, sorry that's kind of not what you were saying, and it sort of just popped up in my head. Why? I, I want to. I want to go on that theme though for a minute. Why do you think um, creatives are undervaluing themselves? I think about some of the the conversations that and, we and have. I, I'm sorry. And just to just to to add to that, do you you mean economically? Economically, and that's if you want to view their value in economic terms. Yes, absolutely. And if you want to view their value in terms of things like social cohesion or civic participation, again, absolutely. And I think about the conversations that we have with developers, let's say, where they might say, OK, we're going to have this wall of this building be a mural, and they'll bring in an artist to make that mural happen. The artist says, OK, this is a great canvas for me, and they make the mural. What's not taken into account is Let's say that that artist has a desire to make that mural community driven and to really go out into the community and figure out what is it that the community wants this thing to be and it becomes quite participatory. Then on the developer side, it might be that that artist making that mural in collaboration with the community helps bring in their project on time because the community engagement around that mural ended up and made it so that the local community board didn't depose it and it wasn't hamstrung for however long it was going to be otherwise. And possibly now the fact that the community has rallied around the creation of that mural, mm -hmm. then it increases the price per square foot that they can charge for the ground level retail because that real estate is more valuable. And so that's something that artists, that, that artists wouldn't necessarily understand that they are doing for that developer. And it's a base as basic of a metric as you know bringing in a project on yeah, under, under budget. Yep, absolutely. I think it's part of it that you know, um, in most cases, an artist is setting their own price, or a gallery is advising and working with an artist to set their price. And people, um, and for an artist who maybe is not represented, they are be because they are the ones setting their own price. They feel often that they, um, you know, they don't, they don't, they're not, they haven't sold that price, so they don't deserve that price. It's confusing because there isn't a way to comp everything. If it's a unique work, there it's by definition it's one of a kind, so there is nothing to compare it to. And so they're thinking, well, um, I, it's supply and demand. If I can sell it, that's what it's worth. And unfortunately, buying and selling art is very much more like a, it's more of like a matchmaking. It's like a dating site. Right? You're, it's only like one and one. They have to. It could be like a really per great person, but just haven't found their match. So. Um, a lot of times artists will say, no one's buying my work, it's not worth this, it's worth this, or it's worth this, or maybe this should just be a hobby, it's not a, a calling, it's not a career. And in fact, it's just that they haven't found their match. They haven't found that collector who is willing to pay six times more, six times what they were going to sell it for, because they understand the value of that piece. Um, it's really interesting your point about you know, murals and development, because we've, in the last year and a half, worked with um, companies for art for their offices and time after time startups cre um, creative companies of course but startups have these amazing um, roles you know they'll have like a happiness officer or um, like VP <laughs> of people operations and um, sometimes I think it means one thing and actually means something else but those are the people who are the most excited about bringing us in to do art for the office because and we, you know, we learned this early on, so now we can go in and we pitch with this. But we'll have artists create murals, or they'll create 
installations or site-specific pieces that are um, driven by data about the company or um, surveys they give their employees. You know, what do you see as the core values of this company? We get, you know, 100 responses from their employees and the artist interprets it. And then suddenly, <clears throat> your employees see their answers and themselves in the artwork that's in the office. And for that happiness officer or <laughs> VP of people operations, <laughs> that they understand that that is worth, they say, recruiting and retaining employees is so expensive that spending three, four times what they would have normally on a piece of artwork, if it's driven by the people that they're hiring and trying to retain, is suddenly so much more valuable. And we've seen like our <clears throat> installation artists that, um, sorry, I'm going way, way off the of topic here, but she just recently created a piece at BarkBox, <laughs> which is a subscription service for dog parents, not dog owners. Um, she surveyed everyone in the office and figured out what their personalities of their dogs were and she made sculptures based on each personality of the dog. She recently did a piece for one medical group where she asked all the employees um, what, they're, what they love about um, the healthcare that they're able to provide. And all of these different projects are, to be completely honest, they're being priced four or five times more than her other site-specific work was being priced two years ago when we first started working with her. And so it's interesting because, in fact, she probably gave more thought to the work that she had to create all the, the research and materials for her in the past, but her value is driven by just completely separately the desire for these companies to retain their, their employees and their budget for um, entertainment. Like sometimes we fall into the meals and entertainment budget, which is <laughs> yes, embarrassing, That's but it's true. <laughs> yeah. So we're, I think you bring up a pretty interesting point, which is that um, we're starting to see different business models. And, you know, and I'm using the term pretty broadly, but I think it's an important one where you, you bring up a fascinating example of, of a person who's connected to the audience in a way that in the, in the technology driven startup world, we see a lot which is all about shortening the cycle from feedback to iteration, to product development, to more feedback, more iteration, better product development. And, and it drives you know, rapid product adoption. Um, so I, I, want to, uh, uh, I want to ask the panel, what, what are the more unusual business models that you've seen that you think are, are valid or that, that work? Um, I have a general thought on that, if yeah. you may. I think <clears throat> what you, what the whole, if you look at, for example, the gallery world, where the, the whole purpose of the gallery was to create a context for the art, I think that's very difficult, and you'll have an answer for this, I think that's very difficult to do online. Some sites do it better than others, I think, but if you look at, for example, um, First Dips or, <coughs> or Artsy, they're so, they're so much available there. So. For them, I think the challenge is to, to create the algorithms that allow the, the, the viewer or the buyer to find the art that they, you know, to drive the customer to the art wherever it is sitting on the <coughs> website so that it can still have a, con a context, you know, but then online. I think even when I go sourcing art for, you know, clients sometimes, and, and we do use sites um, like your site and, and other sites that we use, I think that's a huge challenge because how do you, you know, how do you do that? How do you do that? So um, that's a big question is that, you know, well, it's funny because we used to say like, you know, you don't want to be the Amazon of art and then Amazon started Amazon yeah. art. Um, <laughs> so I think that unfortunately one of the shortfall, shortcomings of Amazon art is that people often don't know how to filter for what they want. So you may say, oh, I, well, I'm a, like I dress in all bold colors. Like I like bold art and you filter for colorful or you say, um, well, I think that um, blue would look really great with my, you know, couch or something, and you, you lose out on all these opportunities. So you're trying to narrow down to what you want, and often what you want is something completely outside of what you usually like, and that's why you like it. And so what we've tried to hone in on in this last year is this understanding of how do you scale, how do you offer more, how do you, you know, add 20 times as many products 
to your company and have people find what they're looking for. And for that reason, I think that Artsy does a great job because um, they're able to say, and not just because one is blue and one, the other one is blue, like, if you like this, you might like that. Um, in a way that Amazon Art just kind of closes you your doors. Um, so what we've done is realize that the conversion for most of our clients happens with a, a service layer. It can't all just be tech. Um, Artsy does such a good job, it could just be tech. But for us, it's about um, using tech to better serve advisory, to better um, listen to what your clients are saying that they're interested in and how to translate that visually um, in a way that isn't so cookie cutter. Oh, this person vacations here, they would like this. Um, I mean, I, can, I, can I give you some words that you're making me think of? Yeah. Is, you know, this is, um, this is a world and a product, like you use the, the analogy of dating, right? It's inherently subjective, right? And what we're trying to do, I think, in part as an industry, is use technology to have a better understanding of an individual's subjective, you know, real subjective um, take on, you know, on the subject matter or whatever it is, right? And then beyond um, helping people find what they're looking for, and this idea of like search and discovery. Paddle 8, I think, is a great company that's um, bringing auctions online in a very streamlined way. And what I love about Paddle 8 is that it serves a really um, big need for nonprofits that are hosting auctions and spending all of their internal resources and time and energy on creating these like auction experiences. They can go to Paddle 8, and Paddle 8 does an amazing job, and they have their built-in networks. They're able to... Um, they don't make any, they don't make any money on those auctions. They did two hundred. They did they they uh, they did two hundred and fifty of them last year. The um, one of the things that that you guys make me think of too is is the on a lot of levels the business model is broken because you've got a huge amount of product that is not easily matched to people and that some artists would sell it at any price. Right, yeah. and and you and you see this all <coughs> over the world, and and in you know we spend a lot of time thinking about museums in my company. The average fine art museum in the United States um, <coughs> spends fifty three dollars a visitor, and they generate an earned revenue eight dollars a visitor. Like that's worse than education, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and. And you know, and it's it's not sustainable is is the point because you know we live in a world where if you run a deficit like that, you have to fund it from you know donations or other things, or you, or you go out of business and there's consolidation, and that's and that's what we see. So the answer is, I think, in part, is how you innovate in a way um, and change the model and get a better understanding of how to match the product with people's subjectivity. It is very funny because like, we, we represent a lot of photographers, and for them, the idea of Instagram is like, oh no, you know, I, I'm already trying to figure out what my photographic eye is for my professional work, and I have to like craft a wholly different aesthetic just for Instagram, right? Which is um, most of them just decide to refuse to Instagram, or they'll just take photos on their actual camera and then post them to Instagram, which isn't really. It, it isn't as effective as people who yeah. do So, um, you know, that's. Where I think it's interesting this idea of the artist as the entrepreneur. I think that for artists who enjoy that, who understand that um, that's one of their skills, social media and marketing, that's going to be a great tool for them. For others, that's why you know, galleries exist, is that they're building their own brand and their own personality um, around their curation, around their eye, around uh, what they, they see as art of note or of interest. So um, when we talk about our Instagram account, for instance, we've decided that we very rarely post just artwork images, and it's much more about um, you know, behind the scenes at an art fair. It's really about what it is like to be a three-year-old gallery working with very young artists um, in New York City. And I think that 
if an artist doesn't want to be as public about their voice, that's when that's what a gallery is supposed to do. Is gallery is supposed to be the best representation they can for that artist. And it's just also part of the time that we live in right now, where many of these technologies are just coming yeah. online. Mm -hmm. And just as my father, when he's typing, is using two <laughs> fingers, and then I can be, you yeah. know. Well, not it, everybody's. There are going to. <laughs> but but I, I think with the, yeah. this, the generation of artists who are coming up now, where it, there is no learning curve because it's always been there, it's somewhat of a different conversation. But it's still a mental curve of always wanting to share. I would think that would be hard for some people to do more. For me personally, definitely. Yeah. But <laughs> for some. Question, right? um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the role of science and technology in the future of the arts, but not um, related to customer engagement or communication, but actually to develop the art? Because in a way, <coughs> before people had to be great musicians uh, to compose the music, and now you have digital synthesizers. You could be an, you had to be an excellent photographer, but now you have Instagram, Instagram filters or Photoshop. Um, even to create abstract pictures, you can design algorithms that will outcome uh, beautiful abstract pictures. Um, what do you think will be the impact of all these technologies there? You know, I, 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 um, I, I don't have a background in art history, so I want to speak first so these guys can correct me for a second. But, um, I, I think it's a really interesting question, and it's been an ongoing debate, and it's it's been romanticized, I think, by art historians, that you know about um, technology and the art and the creation of the art. And I was thinking about the film. I don't know how many of you saw it, Tim's Vermeer. You know, I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, and but some of the debate was, you know, was around did he use technology? And he most certainly probably probably did, you know, to create some of his works. Technology's always been always been used in, in the creation of art. It always has been. There's no mystery there. And and it will just evolve along with the evolution of technology. And people will think of innovative ways to you know to use it to make different types of art. Yeah, like a paintbrush is in and right. of itself a piece of technology. It's a tool, yeah. it's a tool and and you know, just as a 3D printer is also a tool and a piece of technology. And there will always be artists who are able to push that technology to limits that we couldn't have imagined. And I do think that it's, that's, that's a kind of artistry in and of itself to be able to refine a tool to be able to create something else. And it's uh, just zooming out a bit on the type of canvas. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, the question I have is, how do you select the or choose the artists that you work with, and do you use technology at all to help make that decision, or is it still a function? Is it becoming more of a function of the crowd, like matching up the subjective interest with what's available? I wish it was something that we could automate. It would obviously <laughs> save me so much time. But for us, I think that we're in a somewhat unique position in that it still is traditional philanthropy. We are, our dollars have many, like have quite fewer restrictions than many other foundations or philanthropies, but we still go through a RFP process. We get 1,300 applications and end up funding at the end of the day something like 4% of them, but it, it's a rigorous process in terms of the way that art place works. Well, um, excellent last word. Uh, thank you all very much for being here and uh, braving it through a, a nice evening. Um, so thank you and thanks for all of